Heavenly Father, as a church, we gather under your sky this Sunday, Lord's Day, asking your blessing on this service. Bless your word to us. Speak to our hearts. Change our lives. Sanctify us through thy truth. Your word is truth. And as a church, we confess our sins this morning, omissions and commissions. And Father, we pray your mercy upon us and your grace in our lives. Guide us in the way that you want us to go. We pray for our missionaries. We thank you so much for them. Bless them in very difficult times, uh, not able to do what they want to do in the countries they're in because of the present situation. Uh, use them in ways that uh, they have not expected. Uh, bless Dave West as they try to revive the Bible Institute in Argentina and give him grace in that position and help. Uh, we pray, Father, for his family and for the adjustment they make to not be able to come back on furlough uh, at this time. Bless Tim Gosen, Father. We thank you for Tim. And we pray that for that building program and the problems of getting money into the country for building purposes. Help him, Father, we pray and guide in the finishing of that church uh, project. We pray for Pastor Ricardo Doglio, who's preached from our pulpit here with his mother's passing. And we just pray for grace for Ricardo and his family. And we just ask for encouragement for them uh, and all the other Argentine believers there. And uh, Lord, as we we come, we pray for many of our young people in the military, in college, uh, starting out in life. Uh, bless them, encourage them, use them, and uh, work mightily in them and through them, we pray. And Lord, we pray for Dave Dupler and the problem, health issues he has and help the rehabilitation to uh, get him uh, where he needs to be healthy, uh, especially the antibiotics to deal with this uh, particular problem and uh, uh, it's a serious problem so father may it work in serious antibiotics so help him to take it well pray for chubb davis father and uh, we thank you for chubb we commit chubb to you we pray for don as he encourages his dad with the health issues he has and they're very serious ones give the doctors much wisdom much grace in treating chubb as you see fit and we commit him to you. May these cards encourage these folks. Lord, we, we, uh, we pray for uh, the Joy Bag Christmas um, outreach. We commit that to you. And thank you for any, any, uh, any involvement we can be in that uh, for a ministry with Direct Line. Uh, help us to give sacrificially when we can't send the bags this year. Bless those that are at home that would like to be with us that can't. Uh, at, and many have not been able to for quite a while. Encourage them. Bless those that are listening online that may be unknown to us, or, uh, but we pray for them and pray your blessing on them this morning as well. And Father, as a church, we pray for our sister churches. Pray for our conference that's going to be live streamed. Uh, help us, Father, to, to uh, take full advantage of that conference and your blessing on that time in early November. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I'd like to call your attention to Psalm 6. So please go to Psalm 6, if you would, this morning. Psalm 6. I have an idea that many of you know this psalm and have uh, maybe used it before in your own life. I hope you have, uh, but we will uh, look at it again. And as I've studied this out for our time this morning, if you look at different Bible teachers, some divide it in two parts, some in three parts, some in four parts. There's a lot of uh, differences on how different good Bible scholars work through this. I'm not going to get into that this morning, all those issues. But I will say it's a very, very timely psalm 
for the times in which we live. Very, very timely for the political and social turmoil that's going on in our country as well as the medical disarray that our country as a nation is experiencing and it's even affecting churches, which is why we're outside, right? And um, so I want you to think about that as we read through this uh, psalm. And I want, I'm just making some introductory comments and then we'll read it. Uh, David at the end of the psalm mentions his enemies again. And uh, he leaves that to the end. And I want to remind you something we've been saying all of David's enemies were not Gentile. All of them were not Philistines. He had, you know, when a person goes in the American military, you, you swear to defend the country from enemies foreign and domestic. Because why? Not all of America's enemies are foreign. There's domestic enemies. There's domestic enemies as well as foreign enemies. And the military has to protect us in both cases sometimes. David did not just have foreign enemies. He had boatloads of foreign enemies, right? Philistines come to mind, but there were boatloads of other people he had to fight. But he also had domestic enemies. And living in a fallen world, there's always opposition to God and his work and to God's people and their work. And if you think of David's 40-year reign and what preceded it and what went on during it and after it, uh, there was a lot of anti-David sentiment. There were pe people who hated David the way people hate Trump or hate Obama. <laughs> there were people who hated their leader. Not everybody was pro-David in the theocracy. All you got to do is mention some names. And some of these people were hardcore enemies Others went back and forth. Sometimes they were for David, sometimes they switched sides. And uh, King Saul, Doeg, Ishbosheth, Shimei, Sheba, Absalom, Adonijah, Ahithophel, Abiathar, Joab, Abner. I mean, those, are, those last two went back and forth some, right? All of them were Jewish, basically, or, you know, served in Israel. But there was the anti David party that was sometimes growing exponentially in the time of Absalom. Second Samuel 15, 12 said, people increased daily with Absalom. So, you know, Absalom stole their hearts. Uh, he, he, he was very good at stealing people's hearts. But if you look at church history, it's still the same. Martin Luther had, uh, had the Catholics. John Calvin had not only the Catholics, but the Libertines. If you ever studied Geneva in, in John Calvin's time, the Libertines hated him. They named their dogs Calvin. <laughs> They'd shoot off guns at his house, right outside his house all night. Nothing's changed much, is it? And... Uh, Martin Luther had his issues, didn't he, with the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. John Wesley had the bishops of the Anglican Church. Uh, they weren't too favorable. Modern conservative fundamental churches have the liberal church, the New Orthodox Church. There's, there's not much of that left, but there's some. Health and wealth gospel, all that stuff. Now, if you think health and wealth gospel is the gospel, you, you haven't been reading your Bible lately. <laughs> They're part of the harlot church even though they claim to be conservative. They don't believe preach the gospel. And so th uh, there, there, there's the harlot and the bride, right? And so it, when, you, when you get a theocracy in a fallen world, you don't get everybody 100% for you. Why? Because not everybody's saved. You have to be saved to want the theocracy to go the way it should go. If you're not saved, you're going to be kicking against the, uh, everything that's done. That was true in David's day. It'll even be true in the millennium where Jesus will have to rule with a wrought iron. 
and have to put Egypt under discipline and some other nations under discipline because they're not coming to the feasts. It's, it's because you still have people who are fallen, even if the devil is uh, locked up. So it's the way it is, even in a theocracy. And especially when you mix politics and religion, you get in trouble, don't you? Not that your religion shouldn't uh, 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 in some way uh, dictate your politics. It should. But at the same time, you get into power plays. I remember 50 years ago, my grandfather, when I was a government major, when, he, when I finally got over that, he told me something. He waited until I was done with that. He said, politics is a dirty business. Boy, was he right. And I will say it's not gotten any cleaner in the last 50 years. David had his enemies who had evil imaginations against him and toward him. And, uh, and he's talking about those enemies in Psalm 6 at the last part. But he also mentions them in Psalm 3 and Psalm 5 uh, uh, as well as this psalm and other places. So there were people who slandered David, lied against David, misrepresented David, just like they do today. Boy, is this relevant. You know, our president just yesterday picked a new Supreme Court justice. And there are people already telling lies about her. Already. Why? Because that's what people do in power politics. When Ronald Reagan picked, uh, uh, picked uh, Robert Bork to be on the Supreme Court, they just savaged him. It was worse or as bad as Kavanaugh. They savaged him. So much so that our dictionary has a new term for slandering people in politics. It's called Bork them. They actually took it from that incident in 1987. And so when Clarence Thomas was being considered, the Democrats said, we're going to bork him. And so all of that is just political, political blow. And it's not new. It's even getting worse. So this is very, very relevant in a time when we see a lot of lying going on and misrepresentation because David felt it 3,000 years ago and the church feels it too. We get lied about too. We get misrepresented too and so forth. Now this is one of the seven penitential psalms. It's one of the seven. The interesting thing, it's not confessing sin clearly like Psalm 32 and 51, but in verse 1, it's implied. And David admits he's under correction. It's under that Hebrews 12 correction that we know so well about in the New Testament or 1 Corinthians 11. And he, he senses that his physical problems, which was an illness, are caused by God's correction for some spiritual problem that he had. So he knew that God was getting his attention with his illness because of some sin in his life. And we'll see that as we read through this. The Puritan Richard Baxter wrote this, O keep up life and peace within, if I must feel thy chastening rod, yet kill not me, but kill my sin, and let me know that thou art God. That's a great, great poem. Most of us have experienced God in chastening. I hope you have, because if you don't have a chastening, you're not one of the sons, right? And there's something about knowing God's dealing with you with something. It's a precious thing, but it's also a, a, an unnerving thing. And David had physical affliction, some kind of illness, because of some spiritual issue in his life. And he knows it. This is not just part of living in a fallen world. This is not just getting sick because of one of those normal things that happen because of the fall. It's specific in his case, and he knows it. And the 
bad thing is he's not just sick. He knows that God's not pleased. God's dealing with him. Spurgeon said this. He said, soul trouble is the very soul of trouble. And it wasn't just I'm sick and I might die. It's God's dealing with me. It's that 1 Corinthians 11. Many of you are weak and sickly and some are going to sleep. So this is a very timely psalm. It's not just political and social. There are spiritual issues here. And there are consequences to bad behavior in God's world. We reap what we sow. And what he's praying is that he wouldn't get a full crop, right? That God would alleviate that. So sometimes people's financial troubles are because of their sin or their family troubles or their physical troubles or the political troubles, all of that go back. But Psalm 6 is about God, David himself, and we're going to work through it. And I have to say this, life's got a lot of battles, and some of them are private. They're between us and God. Nobody else knows. The heart knows its own bitterness. God's dealing with us with something. Maybe we never shared it with someone else. Maybe we did. But this is a very, very timely psalm in many ways. As are all the seven psalms dealing with confession to sin. William Graham Scroggie said, this is the first of seven penitential psalms. You should read every one of these every day of the week. There are seven of them, one for each day. You should read one of these every day of the week. And that's Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. We know 32 and 51 pretty well from the New Testament, but those others are also there. It was a favorite psalm. Psalm 6 was a favorite psalm of John Calvin, that spiritual giant. And um, I think we'll be blessed by it. William S. Plummer said, Nothing enables a good man, a good man to deflect the malice and power of his enemies like an assurance that his prayers are heard and answered. Boy, is that a great observation. As David goes down through this, and we're going to read it here and then get started, he, his enemies are after him. They're taking advantage of his sickness, and they're saying God's against him. And God's going to get him, and we got every right to be against him because God's against him. And David is feeling all that, but in this, he's taking it to God, and in that, he has a sense that God has heard his prayer. This is one of the great things here in this psalm. And if you know God has heard you, you can hold your head up, right? Even if, he's, if it's a confession of sin, even if he's dealing with you with sin, and you know God has dealt with you in love about it, and you know that he knows all about it, and he's forgiven you, you can put your shoulders back. You can stand up. And that's really what's going on here. And when we get to the end of this psalm, nothing has changed yet. But David has an assurance that God has heard his prayer, even though his outward circumstances are still the same. Well, I hope this is a blessing to you. Let's start reading. Psalm 6. And as, as we read this, I want, you to em I want to emphasize that inner assurance that David has. This is what I want you to walk away with. Now Hannah got in her assurance because of what, uh, what Eli told her about her prayer being answered. But this is not somebody else telling you, some prophet, or it's not that some priest gave him absolution because he offered a sacrifice. This is inner. This is something spiritual. David prayed and God answered and David comes out with assurance. <coughs> that inner assurance. And I know this is misapplied by some people. Uh, God told me I'm going to be healed and I'm, I'm going to be healed. Or God told me I'm going to marry this person I'm going to. Sometimes people mistake what God's doing subjectively in our life. But there is 
especially when we pray with tears that David does. We really lay it out to God. There is sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes there is a clear inner assurance, God's heard me. Even before the circumstances change. I've had that. I trust you have sometimes. And what a relief that is. If God's heard me, it's all good. Okay, let's read it. And I'm not going to use this outline in my sermon, but I'm going to give it to you. It's from the best outline I've found. Dale Ralph Davis, you know I like him as an Old Testament scholar. He has three points. And I want you to think about his outline uh, when we go through it. Again, it's not my preaching outline. It's the teaching outline I'm going to give you, and then we're going to preach it. Verses 1 to 3, the agony he knows. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I'm weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My bones are vexed. My soul is also very vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Now, he doesn't even finish that sentence. He's so broken, he can't finish his sentence. There's a lot of those how longs in the Psalms, right? There's a lot of those how longs in our life. Have you ever spoken to someone who's broken up about something and they can't get the words out? I'm sure you have. Maybe you've been that person. It's just hard to get all the words out, and that's what this is depicting. The agony he knows. Dale Ralph Davis says, he sums it up with David saying, this is the messy situation I'm in. <laughs> this is it. The agony he knows. Two, again, Dale Ralph Davis, four to seven. The argument he brings. We have the agony he knows, and we have the argument he brings. And when we read 4 to 7, I want you to see, if, while we read it, if you can pick out his arguments. Pick out some of the arguments he's giving. Psalm 6, 4, uh, four to 7. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there's no remembrance of thee. In Sheol who will give you thanks? I'm weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Those are arguments. Do you ever argue with God? Do you ever reason with God? This, I'm asking you to do this, and here are the reasons I'm asking you to do it. That's why what David is doing here. Sometimes we just ask, 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 and we don't. God, God wants us to ask, but he also wants us to bring arguments. That's kind of strange, isn't it? He wants us to do that. He wants us to reason with us. Come, let's reason together. <laughs> Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Come to me with your arguments why I should do what you want me to do. And my argument is, save me for Jesus' sake, right? It's a good one. Now, so we have the first part of the psalm, the agony he knows. The second part of the psalm is the argument he brings. And the last part of the psalm is the assurance he finds, according to Dale Ralph Davis. The last part of the psalm, boy, it's changed. This is different. This is a different man. God's heard him. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and very vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Now this last part's a big difference, isn't it? It, it, it really changes in verses 8 to 10. And David's already made a decision. I'm only going to go to God for this problem. He has no plan B, no plan C. 
I'm going to God in prayer and confession with this problem. And as Calvin said, this is the only quarter from which he hopes for deliverance. And as we look at what he has in verse 6 and, and 7 and 8, uh, it's worthy to note in this conclusion of the psalm, nothing outwardly has changed. David's not better yet, but he believes God's going to make him better. The enemies are still there, but he tells them to depart. And Derek Kidner said this sudden access to confidence found in almost every supplication that's in this last part is most telling evidence of an answered, answering touch from God. I like the way he puts it, an answering touch from God. Have you ever been praying for something fervently and you don't know if God's heard you or not, but then sometimes you get that comfort? This is enough, God's heard. Not that we wring it out of God, but just that sense that he's, he's, he knows this, God's got this. My God's got this. That's the movement of this psalm from the agony of concern to the assurance of certainty. So there's a sudden and radical change of atmosphere. Now we've taught it, now we're going to preach it. Okay, you ready for that? Um, question. Do your troubles and mine in this life Political, personal, physical, whether it's a sickness or whatever it is, do our troubles in this life remind us of our sins? Do they bring to our mind that God possibly might be dealing with me about a sin? Now, not all physical problems, illnesses are because of sin. John 9, neither did this man sin or his parents that he was born blind, book of Job, uh, we, we, we know that. But sometimes they are. And as we come to this psalm and we think about this psalm and our response to it, one, one thing we should say, what sh we should often say in the first three verses, we learn what we should often be saying to the Lord about our troubles and our sins. This is a template and everybody, when they think of David's sins, they think of David and Bathsheba and Uriah. That's the big one. And you and I, when we think of our own sins, we think of some big one. That's my sin. But I just want to make this statement. David sinned a lot before that, and David sinned a lot after that. Right or wrong? Right. So there's no, it, it, there's no reason to say that that is it here or that that's it in your life or mine uh, uh, because of something that comes to our mind. Whatever, when God, when God touches our life, whether it's nationally or church-wise or personally, so much we think, I'm going to die. Our nation's going to die. Our church is going to die. Or I'm going to die personally. What's God doing? He's getting our attention. And it might be He's getting our attention because of something not right. Not always, but sometimes. And so this is important. And so David here, uh, let's go back and show what he did and see if we do this. In verse 1, David says, don't do this. In verse 2 and 3, he says, do this. <laughs> o Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, neither chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. And, O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. The bones stand for the inner body, the uh, a vexation that hits the strongest parts of our body physically. And my soul is very vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? So he's vexed spiritually and physically. He's just exhausted. And so we see what David says about his sins. He doesn't specifically say, I'm confessing them. But he's basically saying, I got it, Lord. I hear you. <laughs> I get the message. I get the message. You're not happy with me here. So what do we say when we come to the Lord's Supper tonight? We're to examine ourselves, right? And we're also to not uh, 
uh, get in that situation they were in, coming for the bet from the worst rather than the better. So David goes to God, the God that's upset with him. And in 1 Samuel 36, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He goes to the very Lord that's dealing with him. So what are we to often say to the Lord concerning our troubles and sins? I hear you, Lord. I get it. You're not happy with what I said. You're not happy with what I did. Or you're not happy with something I didn't do that I should have said or done. Second, what should we often say to the Lord about why he should deliver us from our troubles and our sins? That's the argument. That's what David's doing in, in uh, he's giving God arguments. Let's look at his arguments and see if we use them. Number one argument, he says, return, O Lord, save my, deliver my soul, save me for your mercy's sake. God, I need a boatload of mercy, and you got it. Use it in my case. Now, mercy can be loving kindness or covenant loyalty and all kinds of stuff like that, but it, he, he's basically saying, this is a great opportunity, Lord, for you to, to display mercy because I, I can't get out of this unless you're merciful. Display your mercy in this matter of this trouble that's come upon me because of my sin, the consequences of my stupidity. He's asking God to be God. Now, by the way, are we, do we ever look for opportunities to display mercy when someone's done us wrong? Or are we, pretty, are we a strict disciplinarian that hammers them and never gives up and never, never gives it, forgives? I hope not. We're to be merciful as our Father in Heaven's merciful. But he's asking God for mercy because he needs it. He, does, he can't go on merit. He's got to go on mercy. And I need mercy, and I'm asking you to do it because you got it. Two, if I die, I won't be able to praise you on earth anymore. That's an argument. I might deserve to die for this. Maybe my nation deserves to die. Maybe my church deserves to die because of sins of omission or commission. Maybe I personally need to die because of something I've done. Because the wages of sin are what? Death. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And even Christians can lose their physical life because of sin. We know that in different verses in the New Testament. But watch what David says. This is, this is uh, he, he's asking God, he's talking to God about uh, what's going on here. He's moved from I need mercy to this. If you don't give me mercy, you're going to lose a worshiper down here on earth because I'll be dead. Notice what he says. For in death there's no remembrance of thee. In Sheol who will give you thanks? And basically what he's saying is, I cannot go to the tabernacle and publicly praise you if I'm dead. My praise on earth will be over. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying, I'm about to die here if this goes on. And if you kill me for my sin and don't show mercy, if you don't heal me from this illness, I'm going to die. I can't confess you on earth if I'm dead. The Septuagint translates this with a word that can mean give thanks or confess. In other words, I'll have no public ministry down here in proclaiming you. And I won't be able to praise you, for in death there's no remembrance of you, and in Sheol who will give you thanks? I won't be writing any more psalms. I won't be dancing before the Lord anymore. I won't be leading public worship anymore uh, as king. You are going to lose my earthly ministry. You know, Paul had some thinking like that. He'd rather go to heaven, but he told the Philippians to bide, bide in the flesh is more needful for you because I can build you up and encourage you in your faith and so forth, Philippians chapter 1. And David is saying, I can't praise you for delivering me if you don't deliver me. 
I can't praise you for giving me mercy if you don't, if you take my life. He's not saying, oh, it wasn't that bad. You know, this isn't, this isn't a sin unto death. It wasn't that bad. He realizes I deserve it all. He, he, that's basically what he's saying. One writer said of this verse 5, not that the Old Testament denies life after death, but rather puts an emphasis on the present life as the most significant stage in man's relationship with God. I can't do on earth what you wanted me, you saved me to do. You know, there's something, you can pray, you say, I can praise God in heaven. Yeah, but people on earth can't hear it. Right? Have you ever heard the hymns of heaven in Revelation 5? We, they're praising God in heaven, but we can't hear that praise on earth. And David's talking about on earth where people will hear him praise God. The Psalms hit this often, the same thought. And I'm not going to get into individual eschatology in the Old Testament. That's a big, big subject. I just want you to go to a couple of Psalms here. Psalm 115, 16. Psalm 115, 16. Psalm 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord. They means they praise him not on earth, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. You see the same kind of thing in Psalm 88, 9. Psalm 88, 9 to 12. Mine eye mourns by reason of affliction. Lord, I've called daily to thee. I've stretched out my hands to thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? It's the same thing. Shall the loving kindness be declared in, the, in Sheol or thy faithfulness in destruction? Many think that word Sheol means uh, the grave. I, many Bible teachers believe that. I don't. I believe it's the place of the departed dead in the Old Testament. But that's another subject. Psalm 30 verse 8. I cried to thee, O Lord, unto the Lord I made supplication. 39, 30, verse 9. What profit is there is in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? And so, over and over again, these different verses are saying, if I'm, if I'm going to praise you, th this is the theater of my activity as a human to praise you with opposition to give you glory in a world that's departed from you and rebelling against you. That's his argument. That's his argument. Now, let's ask ourselves the question, what would God miss on earth if I died today? Would there be family members not cared for? Would there be saints not profited? by our presence, edified, encouraged? Would there be sinners that would not be confronted with the gospel if I died today? It could be if I live a little longer. Would worship service lose less, one more worshiper on earth? You see, there's something precious about people on earth that worship. We think about worship in heaven. There's no opposition in heaven. There's something about praising God in this God-hating, Christ-rejecting world. And there's something precious about worship of people who will do that. Will the missionaries lose one more prayer warrior and one more supporter? So that's his argument. Here's reasons, God. If I die now, this won't happen at least for me, maybe somebody else will do it, but I won't be able to do it anymore. David served his generation by the will of God. When I'm gone, my ministry down here is over. That's the argument. 
So number one, you got mercy. I'm asking you to display it. Number two, if I die under punishment for this sin or chastening or correction for this sin, there's one less person to give you thanks. That's his picture. And one writer said, a very scholarly writer, not conservative at all, but I think he got this right on verse 6. It's man's calling in the biblical world to celebrate and acclaim God's greatness. And David says, I can't do that when I'm dead down here. That's what he's talking about. Spurgeon said very colorfully, churchyards are silent places. The vaults of the sepulchers echo not with songs. Damp earth covers dumb mouths. And boy, is that right. Third argument. This is the third. There's three. I've had it. I'm exhausted spiritually, emotionally, physically. I'm, without, I'm worn out physically and emotionally because of your correction and chastisement. And on top of that, I got enemies <laughs> that are taking advantage of my situation. You and I live in a world of enemies. We can't, we can't, we got to be have short accounts with God. Not just let sin be unconfessed and undealt with and unforgiven and un, uh, un, uh, uh, get, we dare not do that. Our life is too valuable. It's too important. And so David says in verse 6, I'm weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. My eye is consumed with grief. He says, I'm crying my eyes out here. <laughs> it grows old because of my enemies. I'm old before my time. Have you ever watched people age because of some problem in their life? Just put years on them. You know, David had years on him before his time. If you think about it, he had a hard life when he was young. Some of it was persecution and being a caveman for 10 years. That ought to age you a little bit. For your time but when you when he was 70 he was kind of in bad shape there laying in the bed and couldn't get warm and well no wonder he, he was shot and some of it was the hard life he had fighting the Lord's battles and but other parts it was some of the sins that he did the consequences he's just praying for God to push back some of the consequences instead of the full load of the consequences The poet said, the Lord can clear the darkest skies, can give us day for night, make drops of sacred sorrows rise to rivers of delight. And so God, David's praying for that. So what we looked at so far, what we're to say often to the Lord concerning our troubles and our sin. Lord, are you, are you upset about something here? Maybe you're not, but put your finger on it so I can know it. And he will do that. What we're to say to the Lord about why he should be merciful to us and be sure to put in Jesus' death <laughs> and the blood of Christ. And number three, what we should say to our enemies concerning ourselves when God has answered our prayers. That's verses 8 and 9. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. The Lord's heard the voice of my weeping. Stop bringing it up. Stop talking about it. It's over. I'm forgiven. <clears throat> For the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. I want you to watch that word heard. He says it over and over again. It's very, very precious. Um, notice, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Number one, he's heard. Number two, the Lord has heard my supplication. Number three, the Lord will receive my prayer. He's heard me. It's over. I'm forgiven. And God's going to forgive me in the future too. So you, it's me and God, not just you and me. So you better watch out. Finally, number four, what we should say to our enemies and God's enemies concerning the taking advantage of our situation to mock God to mock true religion and discourage us. Verse, nine, verse 10, 
Let all my enemies be ashamed and very vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Wow. What a precious thought this is, is that he know there, there's people who have disdain for true religion. Whether it's David's religion in the Old Testament, they disdain him the way Nabal disdained him. They disdain us. Uh, do you remember, uh, excuse me for being a little bit political, I'm not trying, I'm just using an illustration. You remember what Diane Feinstein said to Amy Barrett because of her Christianity, or at least her Roman Catholic Christianity, it was too conservative for Feinstein. She said, your dogma speaks loudly within you or something like that. In other words, we, got it. we now have a religious test for the Supreme Court. You can't be a serious conservative person. And you don't, and it, we, it wasn't Supreme Court, it was a lower position. But don't think they won't do something again or try it. I saw a cartoon uh, about Dianne Feinstein and Amy Barrett this morning uh, online. And uh, they had Dianne Feinstein in a future hearing saying to Amy Barrett, Coney Barrett, your dogma must submit to our dogma. That <laughs> really cracked me up. I want to tell you something. We live at a time when people have made their religion, their politics, their religion, and that's a big mistake, whatever side you are. Politics is politics. Religion is religion. Yes, your religion should inform your politics and the way you vote, but don't put politics in the place of religion. But people who deny God will do that every time. Your dogma, you Christians, have to submit to our dogma. And have that arrogant, self-righteous, pharisaical, we got the truth and you got to come under it. Turn with me to John 12. I'm almost done today. Jesus, at the end of his ministry, ended his public ministry to Israel with this statement in John 12. I want you to look at verse 23. There is a reference to Psalm 6 here. And I'm going to point it out here in a moment. And Bruce Waltke said Jesus knew Psalm 6 by heart. And there's a couple of places where that is clear. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, depart from me. <laughs> and I believe it's the same kind of thing as David's saying here, depart from me. But here in John 12, 23, Jesus answered saying, the hour is come, the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say, except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his wife Shall, loves his life shall lose it. He that hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now here is the, here is the reference to Psalm 6. Now is my soul troubled. That, that phrase right there in 27 is an echo of Psalm 6. And what David was saying in that psalm. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And there came a voice from heaven saying, I've glorified it and will glorify it again. What a precious reference to that old psalm uh, that Jesus used against his enemies that were against him all three years of his earthly ministry. Now you and I, unlike Jesus, have not, we, we haven't always glorified God. We haven't always done the right thing. But we can say with David, 
I've blown it. I've failed. But not my Jesus. Someone said, if you lose your religion because some church hurt you, it's because your faith was in people, not in God. Churches will hurt you. Politicians will hurt you. Christians will hurt you. You even hurt yourself. <laughs> As the hymn writer said, all may fail, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. The son of David outdid Sir David himself. And we can tell people, yes, I've blown it. My church has blown it. My nation's blown it. Christians have blown it. But not Jesus. He succeeded. He died. He rose again. He's the Savior. He's the one we look to. Not anybody else. Turn to Acts 13 and I'm done. Acts 13. Acts 13, 36. This is the Apostle Paul. And this is what he wrote. For David, after he'd served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. David died at 70. He reigned for 40 years. And it was over. No more David on earth to fight battles, to lead worship, to praise God. David cerned his own generation by the will of God. He fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man that's the Son of David, Jesus Christ, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I want to tell you something. God judges nations even if they call themselves a Christian nation. Sometimes they die. Our nation could die. Sometimes local churches die. If you don't believe that, read Revelation 2 and 3. Our church could die. And guess what? We could die. And we will die. If Jesus tarries, we're going to die. We won't be here anymore. And, but Jesus never. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He's living, whatever men may say. David is dead, Jesus is not. David served his own generation, the risen, ascended, and returning Lord Jesus serves all generations. I read what somebody wrote about 2020, because 2020 has kind of been an experience of not just social distancing, but social death, right? We're all kind of separated from each other, we can't interact. We've experienced a death of sorts. And someone said, if I'd have known what 2020 was going to be, I wouldn't have bought a day planner. <laughs> so it seems like we've experienced almost like a social death. And maybe God's dealing with us as a nation. Oh, wait a minute, it's all over the world. Maybe God's dealing with us as a world, as a planet. And maybe there's going to be more dealings. Who knows? But our blessed Savior is the one we should look to. I hope you all vote right. I hope you all use your Christianity to guide your voting and all that stuff that's coming up. But don't look to politicians or don't look to yourself. 
Don't leave and look to your church or your pastor for what over Jesus can do. Look to him. And that was David's only plan. It was only, he didn't have plan B. He's looking to the Lord. If you don't do it, I'm done. I'm done. Some of you have financial issues or will have. Some of you have family issues or will have. Some of you have spiritual issues or will have. Some of you have sin issues or will have. Where do we go with that stuff? We got to go to the Lord, right? And that's what David did, and he was successful. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Father, we thank you for this psalm. Bless it to our lives and heart. If there's anyone in the hearing of my voice today that has gone everywhere else for their problems, but not to you or has looked at their problems without looking at the sin issue, may they look at the problem behind the problem. May, we, may they look at the problem that's the root of all the problems, the problem Jesus came to deal with when he died for our sins on the cross and rose again. May they go to the very root of it, confess their sins, Place their faith in Jesus Christ, their Lord. All the other problems of life are meant for us to learn from them, to see where the real root problem is. So help us to see it. In Jesus' name.